the last Tech Talk of 2018. Man, what a year it's been. Uh, it's been a good one. Uh, we're looking forward to 2019. Uh, yes, this go around, we are going to talk about a very controversial topic, as controversial as the last president election and Monica's wonderful blue dress. We're going to talk about engine oils. But we're going to do this like we always do things. We're going to differentiate between fact and opinion. So the first part of this thing is going to be facts about engine oil. And then, uh, of course, I'm sure along the way we'll have some uh, some other shops and stuff like that chime in and then we can open it up for opinion and conversation later But before we do that, I want to tell you guys a couple of great things that are coming for next year uh, If you've been following us, you may uh, have seen the post about our expansion into bike sales. We're doing something quite a bit different um, We're going to provide more of a concierge service for people that are interested in purchasing motorcycles uh, We actually have access to a nationwide inventory in excess of 80,000 motorcycles so uh, in addition to that, uh, we can find finding the bike that you're looking for is going to be pretty cool. Um, not only that, but being able to do in-house financing, uh, consigning used bikes, uh, and even be able to sell used bikes with lifetime powertrain warranties on it. That's a pretty big deal there, guys. Um, and uh, we can get the bikes at a really fair price, saving thousands um, over your typical dealer environment. Uh, which is great. Everybody's got to make a little bit of money, but we don't have to make it all on one person. So uh, be on the lookout. Uh, we're going to be constantly adding inventory to our website about the bikes we have available. Uh, but regardless, if you're looking for one, uh, you can shoot us an email, give us your contact info. Uh, if you want to do in-house financing, we have applications online for that as well. Uh, so we can find out how much you can be approved for and then we can go out and find the bike for you. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, all right, so we're gonna talk about engine oils. Before we jump into engine oils, I think we need to talk about some motorcycle parts. Um, of course, oil's job in, his, in an engine is to reduce friction and reduce heat, okay? So it's, I think it's important that, that we cover some of these parts so that when you, we get, start going through the explanation of engine oils, uh, you understand the importance of it. So um, bearings, that's probably the best place to start. Believe it or not, there's a whole bunch of different types of bearings. You have tapered Temkin bearings like this. You have caged roller bearings like this. You have, uh, this is a cam plate here out of a uh, 06 and back Harley. You can see that's a ball bearing in there. And believe it or not, this is a bearing as well. Notice there's no moving parts. These are called Babbitt bearings, okay? Um, where these are used, it's pretty unique because we're going to have to expand our conversations here. And, and since we're talking about oils in general, we're going to cover some automotive stuff. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about Indian Victory and Harley. The engines are entirely different. Uh, so uh, we need to cover all of that stuff. So one of the key differences, we're going to start with a connecting rod. This is the... Uh, this is a connecting rod out of a Harley, and you'll notice it's a single piece. It's like a saddle rod. There's another one that goes over this, and uh, the way this works is this bearing goes inside the rod here, and then you have this central crank pin. This bearing goes in here, and the rod rotates there. All right. Now, in comparison to that, this is a rod, a stock rod out of an Indian. It's quite puny if you notice. Um, which when we do our Indian kits, we obviously upgrade these rods. But uh, you'll notice this is more of an, what I would say an automotive style rod. It's a split rod. And this is, uses the Babbitt bearings, okay? These are pressed into place, or excuse me, they, they set in place there. Uh, the key differences between these two types, and Victory uses a, a very similar deal, um, and all, most of your automotive applications are as well. The biggest difference here, and what makes oil so critically important, is that, of course, you have friction reduction simply because you have rollers in the bearing on the Harley. But when you move to more of the Babbitt, Babbitt bearing style with no moving parts, the oil film creates the bearing surface. So that means that oil viscosity and oil quality becomes more critically important, okay? And some other changes that took place in Harleys uh, from 2006 and Ford, on this earlier style cam plate, you'll notice that the cams... I've only got one cam in, so you can see what's going on here. You've got a ball bearing here and a roller bearing here, different load forces, so they require different types of bearings. But um, regardless, and 
2006 and back, you had physical bearings in this place, all right? Now, when we got to 07 and later, the cam plates changed. Here, notice there's no bearing, all right? So, actually, the cam surface sits in here. And what you have at this point is very similar to the Babbitt bearing that I discussed in the Indian rod, where you are 100% reliant on the oil film to provide the bearing surface. Okay, so this again became more critically important in 07 and later Harleys. One of the other things that changed in around 2000, uh, 2011, I believe it was, um, in 2010 and prior, you had a bronze bushing in the cam plate. So this cam plate sits on the right hand side uh, and the pinion shaft of the crank comes through here. You've got a gear here. The oil pump sits behind this just to give you an idea. And Scott mentioned, so does the V-Rod. Absolutely, thank you, Scott. Um, uh, Scott Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald Motorsports. Uh, uh, if you guys have got a V-Rod, check Scott out. He does awesome, awesome, awesome engine work on V-Rod. So thanks for bouncing in here, Scott. Um, in the earlier years, you had a bronze bushing in this area here. So the bronze bushing would aid in, in providing friction reduction for the crank that came through. Now in 2011, Harley changed their factory cam plate, no longer has a bushing. And you'll notice, I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not, notice the edge around here. What that edge is, is a burr, and that's essentially where uh, from the crank, um, you know, distorting the aluminum in this, in this area. So uh, that's due to either crank run out or again, oiling issues. So that compounds the problem there, again, making oil even more important. Uh, the other thing that changed, You'll notice this Harley connecting rod, this is where the wrist pin goes in. Rod mounts this way, the crank is here, the wrist pin is through here, piston attaches to the top. All right, so you'll notice there's a bronze bushing in there as well. All right, in 2011, I believe it was, that was another change. Harley removed this bushing. All right, so that uh, it's now a steel connecting rod riding on the steel wrist pin, okay? So as the year models are getting newer, uh, oil viscosity and oil quality is coming e becoming even more and more important. So uh, I think the best place for us to start is the, the, really the differences between mineral-based uh, or conventional, would be the word for it, versus synthetic oils. All right, now synthetic oils actually were developed sometime in the 30s. Uh, thanks to some German scientists. Uh, what they found was when they were fighting on the Eastern Front, the extreme temperature changes with conventional oils, the oil would get extremely thick in cold temperatures. And, uh, and then of course, operating vehicles that they had, they would get very high engine temperatures and they were noticing that conventional oils would break down very, very fast. The other issue was uh, having crude availability uh, to supply their military. So. They developed synthetic oil for two reasons. One, to be more stable through temperature changes uh, and also to, um, uh, to provide another <laughs> fluid medium instead of having to rely on fossil fuels. So that's kind of where it's been around. So synthetic, the, the, the technology of, of synthetic oil has been around for a very long time. Technically, there are three different synthetic bases that synthetic oils are based on. We're not going to get too techy here, so we're not going to go into the different types of base synthetic oils and all that kind of stuff. To be quite honest, don't really, don't really need that information. So uh, let's talk about what the what the actual numbers mean. So you have, say, let's use 10W30 for example. So you have uh, an SAE30. Then you would have a 10W30, um, and uh, you have essentially a, a straight weight, is, is the, the nomenclature people use, straight weight versus a multi-grade oil. All right, so the, uh, and, and of course, essentially, you know, the, the higher the number, the thicker the oil. Okay, the W does not stand for weight. The W stands for winter grade. Okay, so if you see an oil that does not have a, or a viscosity that does not have a W immediately following the number, an example, SAE 30, straight 30 weight, that means that that oil has a viscosity value of 30 at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, if you see a W after that value, then that means that it is the viscosity at winter climates. There's no real set temperature for doing that test. 
uh, on average they use zero degrees Celsius. So if you see 10 W, that means that it is a 10 weight at cold climates for approximately zero degrees Celsius. If you see SAE 30, that means it's a 30 weight at 100 degrees Celsius. So what I did, just to kind of make that, why do we use multigrade oils? I think that's important. So I made a chart. Some people like visuals. So let's see if we can do this. All right, so we've got viscosity on this. Oh, it's gonna be reversed. I'm sorry, guys. I think you'll probably get the idea, though. So what we're dealing with here is viscosity on this side and temperature down here at the bottom. So if we were using an SAE 30 oil, of course, at zero degrees Celsius, a straight 30 is going to be very thick, and as it heats up, it's going to get thinner and thinner and thinner. All right, so if we use an SAE 10, same thing is going to happen. It's gonna be approximately a 10 weight or viscosity uh, here, and it's going to get thinner and thinner as the engine heats up. So the reason they came out with 10W30 is we can kill two birds with one stone here. It's not going to be too thick in cold climates, so it's going to be a 10 weight in winter climates. And then as it heats up, it's going to balance out and become a 30 weight at 100 degrees Celsius. Thumbs up on that, everybody good. All right, now, um, so essentially, as I'm sure you guys understand, if you run a straight weight oil and it's cold outside, it's gonna be too thick at startup, right? So that's why we run multigrade oils. All right, now how multigrade works, and it, I think it's important to point this out because there's, there's a couple of different things that uh, engine oils have to do. Uh, the technical term for it is hydrodynamic lubrication for you techie guys. All right, so in hydrodynamic lubrication is essentially uh, that you're providing, a there we go, I think I jumped out for a second there. Um, you're providing the oil film to provide your, to reduce the friction. So that becomes more important, back to the parts when we're talking about the Babbitt bearings and we're talking about the cam plates that don't have mechanical bearings in there. So that hydrodynamic lubrication is exceptionally important to reduce friction and prevent wear. Now, there are two issues that come up. You have, um, excuse me, SAE 50, let's have a drink. Okay, one of, the, one of the challenges when you're designing engines, remember all the things that go into this. We're talking about bearing clearances that are critically important, okay? Uh, and, and in all frictional surfaces, piston skirts, we've got uh, we've got axial movement on rocker arms. We've got, you know, push rods that are slamming into lifters and rocker arms and all these different things. So one of the things that we are trying to prevent is a term called boundary lubrication. Okay, and how I want to explain that, remember I showed you this crank pin a minute ago. Okay, this is where, you know, again, the Harley rod here and you've got the bearing there. You'll notice I marked on this crank pin, see the circles? Okay, those are the high spots on this crank pin. As we get around the other side, you'll see there's not that many. Now notice an interesting thing. Here's where your oil feed holes are. Notice there are no high spots and you tend to have even wear. As we rotate around to the opposite side, we see a lot more of the circles. Those are our high spots. Okay, if you're not using the correct viscosity oil, you get boundary lubrication. And what happens is the oil builds up around the low spots, not lubricating the high spot in the center. Okay, so imagine, you know, an island, essentially. So you're creating an island here, and then you have the oil that's around it. That's creating friction, and that's, uh, uh, of course, increasing wear. So everyone understands boundary lubrication. That's one of the things that we want to prevent with, with the oil. All right, so um, how a multi-grade oil works, that is going to help you make the decision between whether or not you run synthetic or conventional oils. Okay, essentially with conventional oils, it, it's, it's all mineral-based stuff, uh, they have to add an enormous amount of additives uh, to that oil, and it's what those additives are called are viscosity index improvers. There's another fancy word, viscosity index improvers. Okay, and what these things are, are little polymers. Imagine fingers, okay? 
and they are designed that at room temperature they're in a position like this. As they heat up, those fingers expand. And when they expand, they intertwine with each other, and that's actually what thickens the oil as it heats up. All right, when the oil starts dropping below room temperature, they constrict and they move apart. That's what thins the oil. Okay, so that's how the multigrade works. So you have these viscosity index improvers, you have other additives and things like that that go into the oil, and they're constantly working like that to maintain the, uh, uh, the, the proper viscosity relative to temperature. Okay, conventional oils, they start with that base and they have to add all of those polymers in place. When you move over to synthetic oils, the synthetic oils are actually in manufacturing are produced with those polymers already in place. That's very important, okay? Because you can imagine over time with conventional oils, also being petroleum based, those polymers can wear out. They don't work as fast. So what happens with conventional oils, as the, the oil is cooler and ages, the oil actually gets thicker. And you have the thicker it gets, the older it gets, because the polymers aren't constricting, then you get essentially dry starts, okay? Uh, and and uh, in comparison to that, on the other end of the spectrum, as it heats up, those polymers aren't expanding, so the oil is much thinner on the hot end. Now, and, and again, they're wearing out. Now, if you add to the fact that we're talking air-cooled engines with, with, with Harleys, Vicks, and Indians, okay, we have to run these engines a lot richer, more fuel in the mix to maintain engine temperature, to try to keep it cooler than you do in a car. All right, so when you add fuel, more fuel to the mix, you're actually diluting the oil mixture even more and, and wearing, if you will, the polymers out, to, to, and, and then the oil thins out over time. So we understand that. We're accelerating wear and all these other things. Okay, but with the synthetic oils, since the base starts with the polymers already there, they're more resistant uh, to age and, and change over time, so they maintain that ability uh, to be thin at startup, so you don't have the dry starts, and be thick enough at uh, normal operating temperature or at 100 degrees C uh, to, in order to uh, maintain that proper hydrodynamic lubrication. There's that fancy word again. Okay, so guess what? I have another visual aid. Here's another chart, and it's backwards. So if you guys turn around, you might be able to see this. So essentially, um, what happens over time, this is a synthetic oil, this is a conventional oil. Both of these oils being a 10W30, okay? So as you can see, what happens over time versus temperature, viscosity here, your synthetic oil is going to maintain its proper viscosities through the, through the age a lot easier than conventional oil. Because those polymers break down, your conventional oil is going to, over time, become thicker at startup and thinner uh, at normal temperature, the older that it gets. Okay, everybody on board, thumbs up, right? We're good. All right, so if we're comparing Harleys and Indians, I hate to compare the two bikes, but we have to compare the two bikes. Um, when I showed you the, the example of the parts on your connecting rods and the bearings, and we have to imagine those high spots and low spots, um, Let's see, Gary. Remind me at the end, Gary. I want to answer all questions at, at the end. He said viscosity. You're a funny guy. Um, if we imagine those bearing clearances and how critical they are, especially when we're dealing with a Babbitt bearing, it's a lot less forgiving. But not only the Babbitt bearings like are in the Indians and in the, in the Victories on the connecting rods, we have to remember we're essentially doing the same thing in the late model cam plates on the Harleys, where we have no physical mechanical bearing in place. We're relying on the oil film 100% to provide the lubrication. So if, if you've ever taken out uh, a, a dial caliper or a mic and you've measured these factory parts, they're a little less than perfect. So the maintaining that viscosity is absolutely critically important. So that is really the reason why it's worth paying a little more for synthetic oil over conventional oil. Uh, it's not a dog and pony show. It's not just marketing hype. There's legitimate reasons and advantages to running synthetic oils. Uh, now, there, there, there is a, um, the, the thought is that your, um, that synthetic oils, you can 
grossly extend your oil change intervals. Uh, for our applications, I disagree with that. Um, you know, air-cooled engines are very, they're, they're dirty engines, let's face it, because again, we're having to run uh, excessively rich Rotella. I'm glad you brought that up, Rich. Thank you very much, because that's the last thing I want to talk about. Uh, good call. Um, so, it, you know, we're, they're dirtier engines. We're running richer air fuel ratios. We're diluting that oil, right? So we, the, the more that we can combat uh, the adverse effects of the richer fuel mixtures in a dirty engine, the better. So um, that's, again, why we want to run with, with uh, synthetic oils. Now, um, one of the big things that we need to cover, I, it's, it's very, very common for people to run to the parts store and buy a, a bottle of 2050 Castrol automotive oil to put in their bike. Now, you may be running the correct viscosity, which is great, but there is a huge significant difference between running a motorcycle oil and an automotive oil. So here's the deal. Automotive oils are governed under JASO standards. It's basically Japanese automa automotive standards. There has a lot to do with, with efficiency and fuel economy. And, and things like that. A lot of motorcycle specific oils are classified with the EPA as specialty oils. Okay? So being that it's a specialty oil, it is not governed as strictly as what the JASO standards are for automotive oils, which means there are a lot of additives that come in motorcycle specific oils that will that are advantageous to you improving engine life one example is zinc content they can put more zinc into motorcycle specific oils than you can automotive oils that aids tremendously in uh, wear protection all right then you, then you also have um, uh, like phosphorus you can have a much higher phosphorus limit in specialty oils motorcycle oils than you can automotive oils and all of those those uh, rare or, or earth minerals uh, are what is fantastic uh, in, in aiding against wear inside the motor. So um, if if you're if you're running your Castrol regular automotive oil, yes, will it work? Sure, but it's not as good as it could be, all things considered. All right. So one of the uh, um, oh, and, and one other thing I'll, I'll I'll touch on as well. A lot of the synthetic oils that are available now will meet JASO standards. There are some that fall back on the old SAE standards uh, that I, I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, changed somewhere around six or eight years ago. Fact of the matter is, uh, with the JASO stuff, they have to work around and, and um, a lot of oil viscosity has to do with fuel economy as well, let's face it, okay? So your better fully synthetic motorcycle specific oils will also meet JASO standards. Uh, your less expensive motorcycle oils will still fall under ASE standards. So how you know, um, I'm not going to do a brand plug here, so I'm not going to show you the label, but when you see the bottle, you'll probably know what we use. We'll get to the opinions at the end. Um, you'll notice this label here, and again, I apologize, it's going to be reversed, but uh, you'll notice here you have your classification listings, okay, API, SG, SL, all this kind of stuff, and you'll see this right here, it says JASO standards. All right, that means that this oil has been formulated uh, to maximize flow and to maximize fuel economy, lubricity, that sort of thing to meet the JASO standards, but it still has those, those high additional mineral contents, uh, which is fantastic. All right, so um, Rotella, let's go back to that. That is a very common thing that I've heard for years and years and years is that people run Rotella. And one of the reasons that Rotella works well is that it has a CF rating. Now, CF ratings are, are essentially a standard in oil that are designed for diesel engines. Uh, diesel engines typically are inline, and they see an enormous amount of axial play and axial load of the crankshaft. All right, we're talking, I mean, my truck, for example, makes almost 900 foot-pounds of torque, right? So, you know, you're pulling as much as 20,000, 30,000 pounds with a three, you know, with a 
three quarter and one ton trucks, you see an enormous amount of actual play and force in the crank hitting the main bearings, right? So what the CF rating is, is it's additional uh, polymers that are designed against shear, like this. So you've got a crank that's slamming into bearing surfaces, okay? So that CF rating helps with that. Now, in a Harley specifically, you know how it's a fixed rocker arm on the top, so you have a lot of actual movement. You have a push rod pushing on one side, shoving it uh, against the thrust face on a rocker on the other side, pushing down on the valve, so it's not floating like it is on, on your, you know, tail overhead valve V8 engines. Uh, so you, and long story short, you have a lot of axial play and a lot of actual forces that take place. So that makes Rotella great in the fact that it has a CF rating. But if I grab a really good motorcycle specific oil that has all the additives that I want for the motorcycle stuff, and it's a multi-grade oil and does everything that it's supposed to do as far as my motorcycle, my air-cooled engine, if I look right here, we'll notice it also has a CF rating. Imagine that. Okay, that is the main advantages. The disadvantages of running something like Rotella is that it has an enormous amount of detergents in it. Diesels are very dirty engines. They can build up sulfur and this sort of thing. So those detergents are critically important uh, to reduce the buildup in the sludge in a diesel engine, but we don't need it in gasoline engines. Okay, they burn a lot cleaner. All right, so uh, what you can actually do by running Rotella is diminish some of the beneficial carbon deposits. For example, when you bolt a, you've got the top of a cylinder and you've got a head gasket and you've got the cylinder head that sits on top, there's a very small gap. And when I say small, I'm talking 30 thousandths thick, 40, 50 thousandths thick, maybe only 10 thou wide. It's a very small gap around the perimeter of the top of that cylinder. Okay, that area will fill up with carbon. You want it to fill up with carbon. Okay, when it doesn't fill up with carbon, uh, carbon, ha <laughs> ha, carbon, uh, it, it uh, uh, creates hot spots in the side of the cylinder, can actually uh, promote auto ignition. Okay, so you want that area filled with carbon. When you run Rotella, it can actually remove that carbon. Not a good thing. But then you also can get, you know, small carbon seals that, that develop around the rings and around the ring gaps and things like that that are advantageous to us. So in years of testing, I've tried Rotella and I have done cylinder pressure and leak down tests on bikes that were running, that, uh, you know, switched to Rotella, see the bike again at the next oil change and see a significant drop in cylinder pressures and, uh, um, and you know, cold cranking pressures and leak downs as a direct result of that. So that takes care of the Rotella. Um, so what else can we talk about about oils? Let me stop talking for a second. Do we have any questions? Uh, let me scroll through here for a second. Um, see what we got. Uh, let's see. All right, Gary Chadwick here. So Harley's around 2000 to 2005, conventional oil or synthetic. Um, I, honestly, Gary, I cannot think of a reason why I would not run synthetic oil. Uh, unless we're, t you know, we're talking an old bike, like some of the old ones where the tolerances were much broader, uh, you know, Evo shovel heads, things like that. Uh, you, they were a lot more forgiving. Uh, they're fantastic engines. You had bearings everywhere. Um, I, I wouldn't see as much of an issue running a conventional oil with that. And even some cases, older, real, real older bikes, you know, like shovel heads and things about even running an SAE oil, uh, like an SAE 50. Uh, provided you don't live in an exceptionally cold climate, okay? So, which that's something that I want to touch on here in a second. So, I hope that answers that question. Um, some people use Rotella T6. All right, we covered that, Rich. Um, all right, Steve asks, so if you change your oil to factor factory recommended specs mileage, would it matter? Um I saw a change in the service manuals, and I, and I find this kind of interesting, and I believe what it came, comes down to is uh, earning carbon points, okay? Historically, uh, with, um, you know, if you were using synthetic oils, there was a 5,000-mile oil change interval on primary transmission uh, and engine oils. It went to a 5,000 when it came out with the Sim 3. I will go ahead and say this, I mean, we can call this an opinion thing. I'm not a fan of Sim 3 whatsoever, uh, and I'll get to why momentarily. Um, 
in around, I believe it was 2007, 2008, uh, Harley changed their factory recommended service interval on transmission and primary from every 5,000 miles to every 15 and 20,000 miles respectively. It may have been 10, or 10 and 15,000 or 15 and 20,000 uh, between the primary and the transmission. The funny thing about that is none of the components changed. They were all the same components, all the same gears. Okay, so why is it that you need to change this every 5,000 miles to begin with, but now it's okay to run it every 10 or 15 or 15 and 20 uh, with no component change? For me, I believe it was about er earning, strictly earning carbon points. Um, so that's opinion. The fact is when we service bikes, when you stretch it much further over that 5,000 mile mark, we start to see particulate on the magnetic drain plugs and the primaries in the engines and in the transmissions. So the point that I don't see as much particulate or powder, almost looks like graphite buildup on the, on the magnetic tip, uh, is somewhere around four to 5,000 miles providing you're running synthetic oil. So when we do our services here, we don't follow the recommended 15 or 10 or 15,000 uh, oil change. Uh, we we stick to 5,000 in all three holes. So I hope uh, three hole, holes on the bike, by the way, transmission, primary, and uh, uh, engine. So I hope that answers that, Steve. Let's see what other we've got here. What synthetic oil do you recommend for a victory? Um, hey, Gerald, it's been a long time, buddy. Um, all right, before I, I like to make... Um, Let's make the switch from opinion and, or from fact to opinion and experience. Before I do that, does anybody have any questions on the facts and engineering about oil? Give you guys a couple of minutes. No questions on that. Okay. Um, the honest truth is. Uh, I'm an AMSOIL guy. I have, I have used AMSOIL for years and years and years. Uh, and what I see with AMSOIL, uh, not only do we build engines with AMSOIL, we service them for the life of the engine. And, and for, for years, customers would come in and tell me what types of oil that they're using. And, uh, not, and we've had opportunities to tear engines down, of course. We see where they're wearing, the wear parts and things like that. Uh, thanks, Big John. Appreciate you, buddy. So we've had a chance to, um, uh, to see all of that. And over time, what I found was when we would either service bikes and switch them to AMSOIL or bikes that had AMSOIL in already, I see virtually zero particulate on drain plugs, provided they're changed every 5,000 miles. Uh, and I can't honestly say the same thing about every other brand of oil that is out there. So I would say my opinion is based on uh, several factors. So if, if we look at the... Um, you know the facts of it. We've we've got a multi grade. We know we need that. It's a full synthetic that's manufactured from the beginning with the correct polymers in it, so it maintains its viscosity. It's got the JASO standards. It's got the CF rating. It's got all the things that I I. It's the best of all worlds, I guess. Um, so that's why I choose Amsoil. Now. Um, Specifically, and, and this has been a common thing with, with Victory. I haven't seen it so much with Indian, but I have had a ton of people call me and tell me that they have a difficult time finding 2040, which is the recommended viscosity for Indian and Victory. Okay? Uh, they have a hard time finding 2040. Of course, Amsoil Oil makes a 20W40. Um, but they have a hard time finding it. So people are putting 2050 in and immediately they notice higher valve train noises, specifically in a Victory, uh, being an overhead cam engine. They notice a, an elevated engine noise. They pull the 2050 out, go back to a 20W40, miraculously the, uh, the engine noise is gone. <clears throat> Why is that? Let's touch, let's go, let's switch back to fact now. Um, uh, before I do that, let's say, Mike, have you had any experience with Brad Penn oil? No, I haven't. Um, I'm I'm open to learning anything new or reading about any new products. So I'm not. Uh, 
Um, at, at the, the, those of you that have known me for years and years and years, you know that I am not specifically loyal to a brand. I'm loyal to what works. So if I can provide a better product for a fair price to anybody, I'll do that. Um, so if you've got any information on any oils I'm not familiar with, then feel free to send it to me. I'd love to look into it. Um, okay, back to the victory. So we talked the fact. <clears throat> So the elevated engine noise from running 20W50 versus running 20W40. There is an enormous amount, millions and millions of dollars that are spent in engineering development when they design clearances for engines. Now again, remember, when we go back to bearings like this, the clearances between this bearing and the steel crank pin can be as small as 7 tenths and even 5 tenths of an inch. Now that's point zero 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 five point zero 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 seven so that's seven tenths of one thousandth of an inch that's an incredibly tight tolerance okay so what ends up happening is that and in all the orifices we got to remember yeah i said orifices that's what she said uh all of those orifices that are in the engine all the oil f uh, feed supplies all of the like in the crank pin all of these holes are designed for a certain flow rate. You have pressures, you have volume. The, there's a lot of engineering that goes into that in determining what the proper viscosity should be. So when you run an oil like a 20W50, victory owners would say as the engine got hotter, it got noisier, all right? Now, the reason is because 2050, when those polymers start opening up, it's too thick to fit into all of those orifices, to go through the, go through the rocker, to get into the lifters, and provide the adequate lubrication. It's just too thick. The engine is not designed to run a 50 weight oil at 100 degrees Celsius. So when you put your 2040 back in, suddenly it's thin enough to actually, instead of providing just that boundary lubrication, like we talked about here, the high spots, instead of providing the boundary lubrication, you're getting a full hydrodynamic, uh, hydrodynamic uh, uh, lubrication. So, uh, if they recommend a 2040 because of all those clearances, and if the engine is built to stock clearances and specs, you need to stick with the, the stock viscosity. Um, thicker is not always better. So, um, any other questions on that? 35 minutes just talking about oil. Any questions? Let me scroll through here for a minute. I, I like doing this better out of out in the shop. I'd rather be in the shop than be in my office. Jack and Coke in the cup. Rich, how did you know, my friend? It's actually, it's a little mixed, a little heavy, as you can see. This is a straight 50 weight Jack and Coke. So we're we're feeling pretty good this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, Mobile One V Twin or or Sin 2050. I'm I'm assuming. Uh, Big John there on the SIN 2050, you're talking about the SIN 3 HD stuff. Um, again, I have, where I would separate the two is uh, let's look at the things that we know. There is no question that Mobile One is a fantastic manufacturer. They're OE in just about every European car that's out there. Um, uh, excellent thing, Mike. I want to get back to that in just a second. Um, so, there's no question Mobile One is a great oil. So in, in making the decision, then what I would do is look for all the things that we know. We know it needs to be a multi-grade. We would love to have a CF rating. We would love to have it to be JS, JASO standards. Um, but if it is a motorcycle-specific V-twin oil, then that should mean that it, uh, it is formulated for air-cooled V-twins, high, having higher phosphorus, higher zinc, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I, I can't say I would have a negative opinion about Mobile One as provided that it meets all those specifications uh, and has all those things. So um, as far as Sin 3, what bothers me about Sin 3 is they don't publish that information. Okay, so if you look, if you grab a bottle of Sin 3, I wish I had a bottle of Sin 3 here. If you grab a bottle, you won't see all of this information on the back. That tells me that they're hiding something. Um, as we also know, Harley doesn't make their own oil. So someone is making that oil for them, and why they're not publishing those standards, I don't know. Um, to be completely frank, I don't care. 
Uh, if someone's handing me money and entrusting me in my experience to build them a very expensive engine and we put the time and the blood and the sweat and the tears to make that engine absolutely perfect, I don't want to question what's in the bottle that I'm pouring in the bike. Um, so I'm, I'm not a big fan for that. I don't know where the oil's coming from. Um, and, and not only that, it's um, – there's – and it, this even happened with, with Quaker State a few years ago – or many, many years ago, you know. It was they fight sludge, but yet you tear a Quaker State V8 apart, and it's full of sludge in the, in the heads and the rocker boxes. And it was because, essentially, they were a marketing company. They, their oil was coming from multiple foundries, and those polymers would counteract each other and produce sludge. All right, so obviously technology has changed over the years, which is fantastic. So that shouldn't happen again. But the, the bottom line is, is I don't know where that oil is coming from and, uh, and what those standards are. And uh, I, don't trust, I don't trust the motor company to, to, to hand me a bottle with no label on it and tell me to run it. So, um, so I, would, I would run Mobile One or Amsoil provided, again, all of that fit. So uh, thanks for the question, John. I hope that answers. Um, in Canada, they outlawed... It's a good thing, Mike. Uh, outlawed zinc in engine oils. I know a few nitro drag cars that run Brad Penn oil with very good results have better bearing and crank life with Brad Penn. Um, I'm interested to learn more about that, and I will look into that. Um, I, I have a question for you, actually. Um, in Canada, do they not – is is zinc outlawed even in specialty oils, like, like motorcycle-specific oils or just in automotive oils? Um, I would be interested to know that because I'm not aware, I believe they distribute like, you know, Amsoil and other motorcycle specific oils or, or use specific oils into Canada, but, um, I, I'm not sure if there are different part numbers or not, but, uh, I'm, I'm going to look you up after, after we finish this and I'd like to get more information on the Brad Penn oil. Definitely. Uh, filter preference. This is a good one. Uh, good question, Larry. Uh, interesting thing about filters. They, um, uh, I, I have a good friend of mine that is an engineer at a filter manufacturer, and he and I, we, we talk occasionally uh, about filter technologies and things. Um, I did a lot of testing on the Super Premium 5. Not sure about that. Excellent, Mike. Thanks. A lot of uh, fil uh, research and testing on the Super Premium 5 uh, from HD. Now, they tout that as a 5 micron filter. Okay, so when I contacted my buddy at this very, very large filter uh, manufacturing company, uh, I sent him one of the filters and asked him to test it. Okay, now the way that we tested this, this is pretty important. Um, I took an engine that had 3,000 miles on it and took an oil sample. That sample was sent off for me to find out the exact ferrous, non-ferrous metal con content uh, and the contaminants that were in that oil compared to a sample that was brand new. So we were able to determine the, the molality and, and the content, the, the, the specific weight of the contaminants that were in the oil. We took that and he simulated engine run cycles through that Super Premium 5 filter. And what we found was after about 3,000 miles, the bypass in the filter would pop open because the element was clogged. A 5 micron filter is too tight. So what happens when that bypass opens, the filter is clogged, you're no longer filtering the oil. It's just working around the inside of the filter and dirty oil is going through. What compounds that issue, a lot of Harleys now have factory oil coolers. Uh, they already route the oil, what I believe in my opinion, they already route the oil incorrectly. They go, uh, unfortunately, they go past the oil pressure switch first uh, and then it goes through the oil cooler and then through the filter. Okay, so you have dirty oil going through an oil cooler that has very small orifices in it, and those can fill up over time, restricting the flow. All right, I'm gonna do a little plug for Jag oil coolers here, by the way. I'm a huge, huge fan of Jag oil coolers. When you put on their adapter and their cooler, it works a different way. It goes through the filter first, filters it, then goes through the cooler. Um, so you have actually hot oil going uh, through the filter and it filters it better. So there's my little plug for JAG. We love JAG oil coolers. Um, but uh, anyway, so that five micron filter would clog up so fast and then the flow slows down drastically. Okay, so then we grabbed some cheap off the shelf filters, uh, part store brand filters, which most of your major part store filters are manufactured by the exact same filter manufacturer. 
and we found some of those can be as high as 30, 40 microns. The bypass would never open, but yet they would still filter all the particulate over the lifespan of 5,000 miles, which is fantastic. So what we have to find is a happy medium. And there are two house brand filters that we run that I had tested myself that are right in the middle and work quite well. Uh, one is a is a house as a high filtro, which is one brand. It's an oddball brand. It's not very well known. You'll find it in a, in a lot of smaller bike shops, but uh, that filter is a fantastic filter. Um, I've tested some major brands. I'm not going to brand bash uh, some major brands and found that they basically didn't filter anything. They advertise an enormous amount of flow, but the filtration is terrible. So it's a very delicate balance. Uh, so hope that helps on filter preference. Uh, let's see if we have any more questions. How are we doing so far? Your brain's hurting? Mine is. Um, let's see if we got any other stuff. It's not bad. 45 minutes talking about engine oil. Um, except the Jag fan cooled one won't work with the cycle electric regulator. Um, custom mounts. Uh, it can work. We've made some mounts for those. Uh, you and I should probably have a conversation about that, Mike. Um, a slightly different regulator and a little custom stuff. But yeah, the way the what he's referring to there, guys, is is the um, the factory the way the factory oil cooler is kind of hangs low and then the regulator's under it so the jag cooler is a little bigger uh and then it has the fan so you're repositioning the regulator uh to allow room for the fan and it's a pretty tight squeeze in there um and even if you have custom custom fenders uh it can have uh <laughs> drink some more if you have custom fenders it can get a little close to the fan and, and kind of restrict that a bit but i will say if you can use one of those uh, fan uh, oil coolers, we, I have seen consistently a 30 to 40 degree reduction in oil temperature with one of those. And uh, so there, it's a, it's a fantastic product. We, we actually sell those like crazy and, and recommend them. Um, and uh, we're, we're behind them 100%. It's good stuff. Um, any other questions? Anybody? All right, cool. Um, guys, uh, I guess we'll call it. It is 545. I appreciate everybody tuning in. I want to wish all of you happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Festivus, whatever it is you celebrate. Uh, make sure to spend it with family and uh, take some time off. We are going to be closed the week of Christmas to New Year's. These guys work exceptionally hard during the year, so we're going to give them a break and let them do their thing and uh and we're gonna enjoy it and relax a bit and we're gonna blow out 2019 this year don't forget if you're interested in a bike if you are interested in selling a bike give us a call uh we can help you out with that we've got a lot of new other programs a lot of new engine kits we're gonna be rolling out stuff for indian stuff for victory and all that type of stuff too uh our milwaukee eight engines are, are rocking and rolling like crazy um uh, quick question there. When is the Baker sale? The Baker sale is going on right now. Uh, the, the story with the Baker thing is that uh, I, I, I work out a great deal with Baker. I've been doing Baker stuff for years and years and am actually an R&D shop for them. So anytime a new product comes out, I get to be um, the, the first shop to see it. And we install it and we test it and we put it to its paces. So um, I've always had a great relationship with the guys at Baker. They're, they're a great, great company. Um, so what we do is uh, we, we run a series of, of essentially we, we install them at no charge. All right. Um, we like to see the Baker product out there. We stand behind it that that hard. So uh, when we take pre-orders on, um, on Baker transmissions, the DD7s, DD6s, whatever, and we can even do some custom gear transmissions with shift kill and, and reverse shift patterns and stuff like that. So um, we basically will take pre-orders, and then we do a bulk order with Baker and get several of them in at one time, and then we do free installs on those transmissions. So if you're interested in a price or maybe doing a custom transmission or what we may be able to do, um, you could call me 
now between the 20 between now and the 23rd or you could call me the first week of January because I would expect to place orders and collect orders probably through I would say the second week of February and uh, and then, and then after second week of February I would be placing the order and get them all in and knock them all out so that is that anything else Matt Smith jumped in. Matt Smith, you are 47 minutes late, my friend. You were probably tuning a bike. Um, thanks, Larry. I appreciate it. If there's no other questions, guys, I'm going to bounce out of here. I'm going to pour myself another uh, Captain and Coke and, uh, and head to the house. Um, oh, one last thing. I will say this. Uh, Matt's a smiley face. Um, our... our uh, bike build off for kids was was uh, turned out fantastic turned out awesome uh, if you guys haven't seen anything about that I wanted to uh, give a thanks to the uh, gunfighters terminus chapter for helping us out with that and uh, there should be a video posted if you scroll down on our Facebook page you would find the 2018 bike giveaway deal and uh, we delivered the bikes we built the bikes delivered the bikes to these kids and uh, we had a great time doing that so uh, a real special time of year for us um, all right, guys, I'm going to bounce out. Thanks a million for watching. I appreciate everything you do. Appreciate you following us. Appreciate you viewing. Everyone have a wonderful holiday season, and we'll chat soon. Take care.